In this clip, we'll present our final resistivity-based sensing device. The device is a strain gauge and is used to monitor a variety of civil and mechanical systems. Here we see an image of a strain gauge. Unlike the thermistor or photoresistor, the strain gauge is not made of any special material. It can simply be thought of as a wire laid out in a pattern designed to detect deformation in a particular axis. As indicated by its name, this device is designed to measure strain, which is the relative deformation in a material due to compressive or tensile forces, or as we will see in this equation, epsilon is the ratio of the change in length in the object to its overall length. A strain gauge gets bonded to the structure of interest, so when the structure deforms, the strain gauge will also either compress or stretch. This change in length in a strain gauge, as we'll show in the next slide, changes the resistance of the sensor. As such, we can represent in a circuit diagram the strain gauge as a variable resistor. So how do strain gauges work? As you may recall from early in your circuits class, the resistance of a wire is dependent on its total length, its cross-sectional area, and the conductivity of the material it is made of. The relationship between these parameters is given by this equation. When the bonded gauge undergoes tensile load, which causes it to be stretched, the overall length of the wire that makes up the gauge increases, while at the same time the cross-sectional area decreases as the volume of the wire must stay constant. The end result is that the resistance of the strain gauge increases under tensile forces. Under compressive forces, the wire shortens and becomes thicker, and the resistance drops. In the figure, the strain gauge is bonded to a cantilever beam. When the force F is applied, the beam dense bends downward, and the top surface of the beam undergoes positive strain. The ratio of the relative change of resistance, delta R over R, to the strain experience, epsilon, or change in length to the total length, is called the gauge factor, denoted by G in this equation. For a strain gauge of nominal resistance, R0, that is, the resistance when there is no strain, the change in resistance is linearly proportional to strain. So if one can characterize the change in resistance of the gauge, then one can determine the strain introduced in the structure it is bonded to. If one knows the Young's modulus of the material, then the force applied to the beam can also be determined. Even though the strain gauge is a resistive sensor, like a thermistor or a photoresistor, we cannot simply use a voltage divider circuit to condition the sensor. This is due to two realities. First of all, the strain of interest that is introduced in a structure is very small, on the order of less than half a percent typically. Secondly, the nominal resistivity of the wire, R0, from which the strain gauge is made, is very small and any change in resistance will be even smaller, on the order of, for example, ohms. The combination of these two factors will make the change in the sensor's resistance extremely small, and thus a highly sensitive circuit is used to detect and quantify these changes. This circuit, which we'll describe next, is called the Wheatstone Bridge. The circuit consists of three precision resistors and the strain gauge. So the circuit's laid out as such. We have a node here and a resistor that goes there to another node. Another resistor here. And then another resistor here. And then the strain gauge connects there. Resistors R1 and R3 are chosen to have the same value, and R2 
is selected to be the same value as the nominal value of the strain gauge. Remember, that's R0, the value of the strain gauge when there's no tensile or compressive forces. These components are laid out as two parallel voltage divider circuits. We have one path consisting of R1 and R3, and another path consisting of R2 and the strain gauge. If R1 is equal to R2, then the voltage at this node, A, is one half the source voltage, V sub S. And if R2 is equal to the nominal value, R0 of the strain gauge, then this point here is also V sub S over 2. So, if this point at A is V sub S over 2, because R1 is equal to R3, and at point B, the voltage there is also V sub S over 2, because R2 is equal to R0, then we have the condition that VAB, that is, the voltage difference between here and here, is equal to 0. Under no strain, the bridge is said to be symmetrically balanced, and the voltage difference between the two points, A and B, again, is equal to zero. When the strain gauge undergoes compression, it becomes shorter and thicker, and thus the gauge resistance decreases and becomes less than the precision resistor, R2. As such, there's less voltage dropped across the gauge than the resistor R2, and the voltage at point B decreases. As a result, since the voltage at point B is less than the voltage at point A, the voltage AB is no longer zero, and in fact is greater than zero. So we get a positive voltage when the strain gauge is under compression. Under tensile forces, the opposite happens. The strain gauge gets stretched and thinner, and thus the gauge resistance becomes greater than that of R2. More voltage is dropped across the strain gauge than resistor R2, thus the voltage at B becomes higher than the voltage at A, and as a result, the voltage AB is negative. Let's consider an example to show how sensitive the Wheatstone bridge circuit is. So suppose our bridge circuit looks like this. Where we have resistor R1, resistor R3 along that path. We have resistor R2, where R1, R2, and R3 are all fixed. Then we have our strain gauge, okay, which we'll have as a variable resistor. Okay. And let's suppose for this example that R1, R2, and R3 are all equal to 100 ohms. Okay. So R1 equals R2 and likewise the nominal value for the strain gauge again when there is no strain is also 100 ohms and to keep things uh, relatively simple let's say the voltage across those two terminals is 12 volts so we have four nodes of interest. We have node A here, node B, and we could call this node C up there, and that being node D at the bottom. So using this, uh, these labeled nodes, we can say that the voltage CD is equal to 12 volts. So let's analyze this circuit by uh, first figuring out what this current I might be. 
So by Ohm's law, I is going to be the voltage VCD divided by the equivalent resistance of the circuit. So our circuit's made up of two uh, parallel paths, R1 and R3, and R2 and Rg. And when there's no strain, uh, there's 200 ohms in each one of these paths. So we have that R1 plus R3 is equal to 200, and R2 plus R0 is equal to 200, and R equivalent is 200 in parallel with 200, or simply 100 ohms. So I is 12 volts divided by 100 ohms, or 120 milliamps. So this current I gets split among these two paths. So let's say this is IB, and this is IA going this way. So the current IA through uh, current division is going to be the incoming current I times the resistance in the other path, okay, which happens to be the summation of R2 and the strain gauge, which happens to be 200, over the resistance in both paths, the sum of those two resistances. Okay, so when the bridge is balanced, uh, the current through both paths is equal in this particular case. And so IA and IB are both going to be half the incoming current, or 60 milliamps. So now that we know the current in each one of these paths, we can figure out the voltage drops across each of the components. So let's look at the voltage drop across uh, resistor R3. In particular, we're looking at voltage AD. And so that'll be 60 milliamps, current IA, times the resistance R3, which is 100 ohms. And that's equal to 6 volts. And then let's look, look at the voltage drop across the strain gauge. Again, the current is also 60 milliamps. And the strain gauge, when there's no strain, is nominally 100 ohms. So that's 6 volts. And as we indicated earlier, the voltage drop across these two nodes, VA to VAB, when the bridge is balanced, it's going to be VAD minus VBD. And that's equal to zero volts. Now let's suppose a tensile load is applied, causing the resistance of the strain gauge to increase by only 1%, or 1 ohm. Let's redo the analysis. The total resistance is now a 201 ohm resistance in parallel with 200 ohms, giving a total resistance of 100.25 ohms. Okay, a very small change, but enough to change the total current from 120 milliamps to 119. 0.7 milliamps. Now, on the left branch, we have R1 and R3, which total resistance is 200. In the right branch, we have R2 and Rg, which total resistance is 201. So as such, the current is not evenly divided between these two any longer, and we need to revisit our voltage dividing calculation. So the calculation for IA becomes the current, total current, 119.7 times 201 over the summation of 200 and 201. And with a little bit of rounding, that also uh, turns out to be 60 milliamps. So nothing really has changed in the, 
in the left branch. However, if you do the same calculation for the right branch, we'll find a, the current is significantly less, or not significantly less, but less, and it turns out it's basically um, the delta between 119.7 minus 60 milliamps or 59.7 milliamps. Okay. So since IA is still flowing through uh, resistor R3 and I is equal, to, is equal to 60 milliamps and nothing's changed with resistance R3, the voltage VAD is still equal to 6 volts. Okay. But on the right side, things have changed. So we have a little less current. So this is now 59.7 milliamps. And our strain gauge is not 100 ohms anymore, but now 101 ohms, resulting in a voltage drop from node B to node D of 6.03 volts. So 6.03 volts is not a very large change from 6 volts. In fact, it's only a half a percent. But what is key is noting that the difference between these two voltage, that is VAD minus VBD, is no longer zero because the bridge is in balance, but now is equal to 30 millivolts. Thus using a voltmeter designed to measure in the millivolt range, this very small change can be ascertained. The voltage can be related to the strain, change in strain gauge resistance, and that change in resistance can be related to strain, as we discussed earlier, not only in the strain gauge itself, but in the structure. And if one knows the Young's modulus of the material, then the strain in the structure can then be related to the force onto the structure. This completes our discussion of sensors used to monitor for various conditions in the environment. The final clip reviews the systems level concepts presented in this module.